All right, this is James for Beginners, uh, lesson number eight in the series. The title of this lesson, Who Do You Think You Are? Who do you think you are? And we'll be covering James uh, chapter four. Uh, just two verses, but boy, those two verses have a lot to say. I want to begin by saying that nothing destroys a Christian's faith faster than his own tongue. <laughs> more than persecution or martyrdom. Very few of us are destroyed through martyrdom. Plenty of us are destroyed because of the things we, we say. James, therefore, spends two out of the five chapters of his epistle dealing with the sins of the tongue and its effect. Now before, in our last class, he talked about a specific group. He talked about teachers and their tongues, their speech, the things that they said, and how it affected you know, the people that they uh, spoke to. In chapter four, he, uh, he's going to talk to um, um, uh, everyone this time about a particular sin of the tongue that affects everyone, not just teachers. This sin causes more problems in the church than any other, and the sin is the, the sin of gossip. I mean, if you've served as an elder or a deacon or a minister in the church where you're kind of, you have access or you're tasked with solving issues or solving problems or you know, you know, kind of uh, 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 delivering service you know, to a group of people, you find out very quickly that you know, inter-church gossip causes more problems, more misunderstanding, more hurt feelings, more people who leave the church more broken relationships than, than, than other things. It's a, it's a serious problem. So uh, he says in chapter four, verse one, it's very plain, it, you know, he, he doesn't take a, an entire chapter to say it, do not speak against another brethren. Do not speak against another brethren. Pretty short, pretty, I don't have to kind of develop this and explain it. It, it. it says what it says. But perhaps we can, we can look at when do we do this? You know, speaking against the brother? Well, first of all, when someone else is not as good in or at something that we think they ought to be. Well, he calls himself a deacon, I want to tell you. Boy, I mean, if I, if I was a deacon, that's, I'd be doing a lot better than that. You know, if you're going to be a deacon, you, you know, that kind of talk. When someone, for example, is not living up to a standard that we have established. In our own mind and in our own heart, we've established the standard for whatever. How someone should be, how someone should dress, how much someone should weigh or not weigh. And someone who doesn't meet our standard, all of a sudden, we're free to discuss that with other people. That's, that's gossip. We notice it, we point it out, and especially we share the other person's weakness with someone else. Sometimes it's even an imaginary thing that we assume that they do, or think, or, or we assume that they've said this, or, or we've overheard this from someone else. Sometimes the gossip, the talk, is like two, three generations removed. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus says, the good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. The real problem, Jesus is saying, is in the heart. When else do we do this? Well, when someone else is better than average or better than us at something, they have more money, they have better looks, they've had more opportunities, they've had access to or taken advantage of more education. Perhaps they have more zeal spiritually than we do. How do we do this? Sometimes we, you know, sometimes we pick out the weakness and we pick at it and we expand it and we spread it out and we, you know, we offer it as an hors d'oeuvre to anyone who will listen. Sometimes we do it in reverse. Sometimes we reserve our praise and we reserve our encouragement. 
I, I, I've known, you know, ministers know each other, right? We go to preachers meetings, they talk. A lot of ministers, a lot of times, leave the place where they're working at, not because they're not making any money or you know, good enough money, or not because the church is not growing, or, you know, but because there's so little encouragement. Some guys work at a church for 10 years and there are members they've never spoken to. Some members have never one time said, that was a good job, or we enjoyed your series, or thank you for doing that. You know, nothing, zero, zilch. Sometimes we choose to notice a weakness or a negative thing about that person, which is secondary. And we repeat it to other people or we remind everybody else how undeserving that other person is. What's the result? Well, the result, of course, is pride. We're afraid that they may be better than we are. We elevate our personal worth by lowering, lowering theirs. And of course, that doesn't happen just in the church, right? I mean, that happens everywhere. You, you can't get away from that. And we all, including the speaker here, we all do that from time to time. The point, the point that, that uh, James is making, you notice when he said, he said, do not speak against who? Of the brethren. His point is, of course, that's standard practice out in the world. He's saying, but in the church, we're hoping that we're, we're better than that as Christians. And of course, Jealousy. Sometimes we're just afraid that somebody else will receive more love than us, or more praise, or more credit. I think I mentioned this before in another class, but I, I think it's worth repeating. It fits perfectly here. The president of, and see, I don't even remember his name, and, and, and actually that adds to the story. Uh, the president of the Vancouver Olympics, when they had the Olympics in Vancouver, you know, there's always somebody who's the president of the Olympics. He's the, he's the director. He's the guy that brings it all together. And the Vancouver Olympics, historically, was one of the most profitable Olympics on record. Usually cities, you know, they get soaked. They lose money with these things and it's a big debacle. And, but in Vancouver, they made, the city made money. And they were interviewing him once at his office and right behind him, I was watching it, and right behind him there was a, like a, a sign, a little thing that was on the wall that said, you can accomplish anything if you don't care who gets the credit. <laughs> and I, I don't remember his name, but I remember the success of the Vancouver Olympics. You can accomplish anything if you don't care who gets the credit. And isn't that a lot of times the problem when, th you know, when we're working as a team or as a group, there's always somebody that wants to get credit and, and a lot of their motivation is simply to be, you know, to receive praise of some kind for the success or avoid blame. <laughs> You've probably worked at places where your boss, his main job was to make sure that he wasn't blamed for anything he could spread that blame out on the floor. Well, that's what this is all about. Of course, the antidote to jealousy is what? Well, love. Perfect love, Jesus says, or John says, casts out fear, 1 John 4, 18. Okay, so two things that we are doing in reality when we speak against a brother. Now, I've explained Speaking against a brother involves certain things that I've just kind of gone over. But what is really happening when we're speaking against a brother? Here's what James says. He says, when you're speaking against a brother, in essence, what you're doing is you're judging the law. So he says, he who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. Isn't that interesting, making that connection? So he says, if you speak or judge your brother, same thing, by the way, you are speaking and judging the law. So my question is, what law? A civil law? 
Is there a civil law somewhere that says, you know, Article 2, Paragraph 4, you're not allowed to speak against your, unless it's slander, you know, there's a law against that, but is it a civil law? Where speak, is it the Ten Commandments? There's no Ten Commandments there that says you shall not speak against your brother. No, the law that he's talking about is the law of liberty and grace that he spoke of in James chapter 1, verse 25. The law of liberty and grace that protects all sinners who rely on Jesus Christ for forgiveness and righteousness. That law, that's the law being broken. Because that law says, love your brothers, forgive your brothers and sisters, 70 times seven if necessary. So if you speak evil against brothers, you speak against this law which is supposed to be protecting this brother, this sister. And in doing so, you violate this law with your judgment. The point is, God has judged and found this person innocent through the blood of Christ. You've come along and said, oh, it's, that's not good enough. We're removing that law. We're going to use my law. And my law says, He's just not good enough in this area. And I have a right to point it out to everybody. Again, in other words, you don't do what the law says because the law says, love your brother. You have decided to become a judge of the law. In other words, you don't agree with this law. You question this law. You're going to change this law. Again, in other words, you remove the grace that protects this other person. In verse 12a he says, there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. So you not only judge the law, you have become a lawgiver unto yourself. So if you become a judge of the law, you have now taken a position as a lawgiver. So James says, you have no right to take this position. Only, only God can be the judge over the law. And there's a reason why only God can be the judge over the law. First of all, because He has all the facts. He knows where you were born and how you were treated as a baby and the number of times that you were neglected. And He knows about the moment, maybe the time in your past when you were abused that nobody else knows except you. He know, but He knows it. And he knows every disappointment. He knows every unfair thing that has happened. He knows every single thing about you, every thought, every twist and turn of your thinking throughout your life that has brought you to where you are and the way you are now. He knows that. And he also knows the heart. Secondly, only he is without sin, so he has a right to judge. Remember Jesus, when he was talking to the crowd about ready to stone the, the woman caught in adultery, what did he say? Well, you know, the, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. <laughs> Nobody can do it. Jesus could have done it. He had the right to do it. He chose not to. And then thirdly, only God has the wisdom to both give the law and to judge by the law. This is why I say, you know, stop worrying about how is God going to judge my grandma and my Uncle Joe who's gone. And stop worrying about that. Realize that your Uncle Joe and your grandma, is, they're going to receive the absolute fairest judgment possible. You know, I don't even want to judge myself. Because I know God will do a better job at judging me than I will in judging me. So the encouragement that he gives, that James gives, I said we're only doing two sentences, right? Two verses. He says, but who are you to judge your neighbor? In other words, that's the title of the lesson. Who do you think you are? God? You think you're God? And what he's doing, he's trying to get, you know, he's trying to drill down into this sin of gossip and speaking against others. He's trying to drill down to show what the real issue is and what the true violation is. It's not just that you may have hurt somebody's feelings 
or you may have tarnished somebody's reputation. Well, that too. But at the base of it, you're taking God's place. You've decided you're going to be the judge of this person. And it's a terrible sin because it destroys fellowship, it produces arguments and division. You know, it's very hard to have warm feelings with someone that you happen to be speaking against. <laughs> have you ever had, uh, you know, this has happened to me, have you ever been you know, three or four people and you're kind of yakking away, I don't know, you're doing something and it doesn't matter where, and, you're, and all of a sudden, you know, so-and-so comes up and you say, oh my goodness, did you go to the wedding? Oh, that wedding, oh. <laughs> You think they could have put a little more effort into the cake? You know, I could do a better cake myself. You know, and, and this is going on. And then the girl happens to walk. You know, the bride happens to just walk in. And everybody goes, oh, hi, Denise. Nice to see you. you, know, and you I mean, you get all red. Why? You feel guilty. It also destroys a reputation and it destroys your reputation as well as the person that you may be speaking against. Remember, whoever speaks to you against someone else will eventually speak against you to a third party. And of course, it can destroy salvation. I want to read a passage here. You can stay in James, but it's over in Psalm uh, 101 verse 5 it says whoever secretly slanders his neighbor him I will destroy. No one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. Those are pretty harsh words. He's not talking about somebody who committed murder here or who's falling down in front of an idol. He's talking about someone who is speaking against a brother or a sister. So it's a serious problem uh, and I think all of us are guilty of it at uh, one time or another in our lives. It's just that we need to say, I'm doing this and this isn't right what I'm doing and I got to deal with this thing. So the solution, if this is our problem, three steps. There could be more, but three for now. Learn to help. If you see a legitimate sin or weakness in your brother or sister, Here's your plan of action. First of all, don't be shocked because everybody sins. Secondly, don't quit the church. How many people could tell, oh, they're just hypocrites, or oh, that brother did something wrong. That brother, I don't know what, uh, he was arrested, DUI, you know, and he actually served the communion last week. I can't be part of a church with people like that. You know? Really? You want us to delve into your background and put that in the newspaper anytime soon? Don't snicker, don't gloat, and don't talk against that person to other people. Follow the biblical plan for dealing with a brother who has stumbled in sin. Learn how to help that person. So what do you do if someone legitimately has fallen into sin. Well, in Galatians chapter six, Paul says, brethren, even if anyone is caught in any, tres any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. So help him to restore his position with gentleness. What does it mean with gentleness? Well, it means without pride, without self-righteousness. Restoring is here, the word in the Greek, is a picture of setting a broken bone, actually. It's a medical term, to set a bone that has been broken. In this word here, you know, uh, restore, there's no judgment. There's no punishment here. It's strictly a helping thing. There is a time and a place to correct and to discipline and even to rebuke those who are in sin because of their refusal to repent. Not the fact that they have stumbled into sin. The thing that draws rebuke is not that they've stumbled into sin. The thing that draws rebuke is that they refuse to repent for the sin that they have committed. That's what draws the rebuke. The first impulse, of course, is to restore gently one who is caught in a trap. 
a person has been caught and you are gently opening the trap to release them. Secondly, he says in verse B, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be uh, tempted. So first, keep an eye on your own weakness in this area as well as the temptation to judge rather than help. And then remember that sin is very powerful and we can be swept away with the other person if we're not careful. You know, it's one of the first things they teach those who are going into counseling. The, you know, the problem of transference. People transfer their emotions onto the person who's counseling them. Imagine a woman goes to see a counselor, let's say it's a male, and she's going through a terrible marriage and you know, she's having problems, her husband is violent and unloving, and, so, and now she's talking to this counselor person and he's just listening to her. And he's paying attention and he's being thoughtful and he's being helpful and he's being encouraging and all of a sudden the counselor is being all the things that her husband is not. And all that love and all that emotion that's inside of her that can't go to her husband, where do you think that that goes? Well, it can easily be transferred. That's why they call it transfer. It can be transferred to the counselor. And it's one of the very first things that those who go into professional counseling are trained to avoid because it so easily happens. And so you know, 2,000 years ago, Paul is saying the same thing. Be very careful you know, when you're trying to help and you're the helper person and you're you know, the counselor person that you yourself are not caught up in this thing. Seeing and acknowledging our own weakness gives us the right spirit to deal with another who is weak. He says also uh, in verse two, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So you find out what you can do to make this person's load easier. Maybe they fell, maybe they're weak you know, because they're just overloaded. Too much emotion, too much trauma. They can't take it. They're, they're, they're working out their trauma but doing it in a destructive way. You know, it's usually easy to see where the person went wrong. What is needed is a solution, not a confirmation of failure. You know, not, I told you so. <laughs> it's very tempting, I know, but it's not very helpful. It's not very helpful. You know, when I decide I'm going to see you know, brother so-and-so about their problem, make sure that you're going to bring along your desire to help not only your desire to point out their fault. Instead of thinking and saying, here's what you need to do. We've all done it, right? Here's what you need to do. So simple. I mean, you're, you're seeing it. I mean, why isn't this guy doing this? It's clear as day. Let me just, here's what you need to do. You need to arrive with the words, what can I do to help? That's better. What can I do to help? Usually the person will say, well, just listening for now. OK, that's helping. And then in verse three to five, he keeps going. And notice before he says, and thus fulfill the law of Christ. What's that law of Christ? Well, loving. He says, for anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another, for each one will bear his own load. I mean, it's inevitable that we will make judgments, but when we do, make sure that you compare yourself to Christ, not the other person. I don't compare my ministry to Marty's ministry. I compare my ministry to what Christ has given me to do. And then I get a, you know, I'm getting a pretty fair, accurate you know, picture of how good I am or if I'm succeeding or if I'm, you know, if I'm being effective or not. Compare your work to Christ's work. Compare your righteousness to His righteousness. 
When we go through this exercise, we find that we have really no reason to boast or be proud or reason to despise anyone else for their weakness. Actually, this comparison stimulates thanksgiving and a true desire to help other people. And you may be thinking, well, how did we get from gossip to <laughs> counseling tricks or techniques? Well, we got from gossip to here because gossip is destructive. We destroy other people with our mouths. We uh, accentuate the weaknesses and the failures of other people with our mouths. And the Bible says instead of destroying them, help them. Help them. James, a very short epistle, James, bang, bang, he just points out the problem. He, he doesn't give a lot of, but Paul gives, that's why we're in Galatians. Paul talks about the very same thing, but he gives us a little more detail on how to offer that help. Okay? So all of this doesn't mean we can't correct someone who is in sin. We must go to those caught and trapped in order to save their souls, but we should be ready to go with this attitude. Otherwise, we do better to remain quiet and just mind our own business because we end up doing more harm than good. So dealing with sinful brothers, instead of slandering them, learn to help them. That's number one. Number two, learn how to be lifted up. If you humble yourself, God will exalt you and you won't have to do so or do it by speaking against other people. James says, but he gives greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The proud is the individual that uses his mouth to destroy the other through gossip. The humble is the one that mm, bites his lip and figures out a way to help the individual instead of destroy them, destroying them. And so learn to help learn how to be lifted up, and I could add, learn how to be lifted up properly. You know, much evil communication is the result of frustration. We don't like ourselves, we don't like the progress that we're making, and so we bring others down to a point where we actually start to look good in comparison to them. When we get in the habit of lifting others up through gracious words and kind acts, we're going to begin to like ourselves more and we're going to be less tempted to speak against other people. So the solution, you know, some of the solutions, learn to help, learn to be lifted up. When offended by others' words and actions and attitude, learn to be like Jesus. Just say nothing and leave the judgment and the condemnation to God. We'll switch over to, uh, to Peter here, 1 Peter 2. He says, for you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His steps who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Notice here, he said he didn't fight back, he didn't, you know, he didn't call on an army, he didn't, somebody reviled him, he didn't revile him back. That doesn't mean he didn't do, not, he didn't do anything. He remained quiet, okay, we get that part, but you notice at the very end <laughs> what Peter says? Yeah, he, he meaning Jesus, he remained quiet and what did he do? He kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, Peter is saying, yeah, Jesus didn't you know, fight back, call on an army, revile back, he just, He's just waiting for the judgment to come. <laughs> Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Yeah, that's what he's waiting for. So it doesn't mean you, know, you walk off in a huff if you're offended or you pout or you turn the other person off or you, you know, just say and do nothing evil. That's the point. 
Continue to do good, continue to say good to the other person. You'll either win them over in this world or provide a sure witness for their guilt in the next. You know, what do you want me to be? Do you want me to be your friend now and forgive you now? Or do you want me to be a witness for your destruction when the judgment comes? Up to you. You choose. That's the attitude. So talking against brethren, you know, major problem in the church. I have to say in this church, less so. I've been in a lot of churches. And the proof of that is when we talk about, you know, I, I, uh, there was a brother from Tulsa that came to visit you know, Bible Talk and he wanted some information. Anyways, and you know, it's a courtesy thing when another minister comes, just like when somebody comes to your house, this is the living room, and oh, we put in a new patio, you, know, you show them around your house. Well, preacher comes to your church office, you, know, you give them a tour of the building. That's just the way it works. You know? <laughs> this is, oh, nice auditorium. How many can you sit in here? Oh, 7,000. And then we, you know, we <laughs> on a slow Sunday, and then you know, I show them the World Bible Study, you know, the World Bible School room, and I, the, the you know, points of interest. You know, wow, that was nice. And then I tell them, uh, so how long has the church been here? I said, well, the Choctaw congregation has been here 77 years in this community. And then I add, not to provoke Satan, and then I had, and has never had a split. There's never been a split here in this congregation in 77 years. Nobody has ever walked out mad and formed another church and took 40 people with them you know, to plant another church. That's never happened. I'm not saying it'll never happen, but it has never happened. And you know, a lot of credit goes to our elders because of that. Because that's unusual in many, in many cases. That doesn't happen all the time. So that's why I'm saying the gossip issue is not as bad an issue here. And the proof of it is we've managed to maintain unity for these uh, many dec decades. So talking against brethren, major problem in the church. We sin when we do this because we refuse to put God's law of love and forgiveness into practice and we substitute our own law of judgment and condemnation for it. The solution, just a quick review. Number one, learn how to approach a person who is in sin with a gentle and humble and empathetic attitude. Number two, learn to raise our own self-esteem through love and service rather than through criticism of others, even criticism of self. You know, it's a vicious cycle. The more you criticize, the less you love. The less you love, the more you criticize. That's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 7, 1, you know, judge not lest you be judged. He's not talking about the, the great judgment. He's talking about you know, criticism. The more you criticize, the more you put down, the less love you have, the less love you receive. It's just a vicious cycle. And then number three, learn to say nothing and to continue to do good when persecuted or slighted or humiliated uh, because this is what Jesus did. Let me just finish by reading a Psalm 133. The psalmist writes, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. So peace among the brethren is not only a delight, but it's a sign of total blessedness within the assembly. It's like a perfume, he says, that fills the body at every point so that whenever and wherever you are and whoever you are with, you can sense its gentle fragrance. No matter who you're with, you sense the love in the congregation. And I can tell you from experience, the most repeated thing that people say to me when I go somewhere and they say, you're with Choctaw, oh, I visited that congregation, oh, I was there back in 85 or something, and then the next sentence, the most repeated thing, what a loving congregation. What a loving congregation, over and over again. They don't talk about the size of the church or our building, they always talk about the great love that's in our congregation. So that's a, a marvelous witness of of what is going on here. Okay, there we go, there's the bell. 
Lesson number eight, that's it. We continue uh, next week.